Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another Prog Report podcast. Today we have an interview with a great musician and guitar player, member of the band The Fierce and the Dead, who have a brand new album out called The Euphoric, which is available everywhere. Pleased to welcome Matt Stevens. Well, good to finally talk to you, man. How you doing? Yeah, I'm really good. Really good. Loads going on at the minute. So it's all been, um, since this record came out, everything's got a bit weird. Um, but it's good. It's really good. But it's just been <laughs> super busy. Lots going on and... It's great. I'm not complaining at all. It's fantastic. No, that's cool. I mean, I think uh, you guys are definitely getting a lot of positive publicity on this thing. It's everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's got to be feel good. It's amazing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's just been. Um, I I we never expected it to come over this well, and uh, the you know Prog Magazine have been really behind it, and um, you know they made like the featured album of the month and. Um, yeah, no, it's been it's been um, every sort of press I've seen is really classic rock magazine. A lot of a lot of really good sort of feedback online as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's been you know it's just the first one. We've, this one sort of came out and it's, it's sort of virtually outsold everything else we've done. So we did like a week, which is just bizarre. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's that's, that's great. So you know the Prague sort of label with with your band. Do you feel like it's because uh, I don't think you guys are a traditional prog band like you know Yes and Genesis and stuff. So, how do you take that label and is it something that maybe you might have been against once or you like the label or how do you feel about that? Um, I'm largely. I mean, it's always going to go back to how you divide, do, um, decide to define progressive music. Right. So I'm fine with being seen as progressive music, and uh, but it's when it's. I mean, it's, it's always that line between sort of strictly symphonic rock and music uh, that is associated with the 1970s, and then the people who are doing something that's um, not like that. You know, your cardiacs and your. Um, you know, your bands like you know, Mogwai or you know someone who's who's progressive but not being traditionally symphonic. So, you know, if you go onto any prog forum, the, the thing that you see people most debating is what is progressive rock, or right. is the, it's the eternal question right now? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's all you sort of, um, you know, you, you will always see that. And for a band like us, we're sort of um, when we first started doing stuff, we attracted people who were into weird, progressive stuff, and that audience grew with us and has continued to grow. So while I feel, you know, some people might say, listen to us and expecting a traditional prog band, they will be probably sorely disappointed. But if they want to hear a band is, you know, like a, um, they're trying to do something progressive with rock music, they might enjoy it. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of people like Voivod and Cardiacs and, um, and, you know, the people who, who are trying to do something interesting with King Crimson, another one that comes to mind. I mean, so just t- taking things from a lot, a lot of different influences, Faith No More, um, bands like that, who were just trying to do different things. With yeah, the- you know what, I, I sort of agree yeah. with you. And I, I think that a lot of people that like progressive music look at anything nowadays that's marginally even interesting a band that's trying to do something different or experimental or or doesn't care about having a hit single or something and that it becomes music that they can relate to also because it's a sort of the matter of how you how you think about the music you know and so now Prague is almost a trendy label it's it's the new rock label I think sort of (laughs) it's you know it's it's um during the 90s when I used to tell people how much I love King Crimson and the Marvel Vision Orchestra that was, wasn't necessarily the coolest thing to be into but right. um, the world has changed you know and there's people like Mars Volta and Radiohead and you know and always they were the bands you know I really loved um, as well you know, Mars Volta Radiohead um, there's a lot of people just doing stuff that's interesting with the form and you sort of follow along that really and um, you know I was very lucky that when I was a kid my guitar teacher was into Bill Bruford solo stuff and King Crimson and the Mad Vision Orchestra and Alan Holdsworth and right. you know all those that sort of music. So that was always in there for me as well. So when um, when we started the Fierce and the Dead nearly seven or eight years ago, I mean we always got sort of post rock and then we also got prog rock and then we got experimental avant garde stuff. But we're really not like that. We I always consider us more of a band that's um, Focused on playing good tunes, music we like, like 
you know, um, we're not really that. I don't. I've never thought we were that out there. I always thought we just played really melodic music. Really, it's, it's, it's very melody driven and very sort of you know. Whilst it takes influences from a lot of different places, I, I hope there are hooks in there and and you know. It's, yeah. it's, I don't think it's difficult music at all. I really don't. I don't think it's, you know. And sometimes you know, it, people sort of think it's it's quite difficult. Oh, we haven't got a singer, but it's still very melodic. It's still there's there's still a lot of hooks you know, for people. I think. No, there's a lot of bands that uh, are instrumental and having a lot of success nowadays, but they're more on the technical side, right? So you have yeah. you have that animals as leaders and you know all those Pliny and all the all those kind of people. Yeah. I mean, how do you see yourself along those people? And is that music you like or don't like? Is that it's an entirely well, different um, approach? I mean, <laughs> I, we support the aristocrats. So <laughs> okay, well there you go. You know that was an interesting experience because they are. I'd probably consider them probably the three best musicians I've ever heard in, yeah. in the. In, you know Guthrie as a guitarist, I think Guthrie is the best lead guitar guitarist there is. He's a lovely man as well, but you know he's he, he is in terms of pure lead guitar player. I think Guthrie Govan is the best out there at the moment, and you know there's a, I think the standard of playing amongst musicians is so high now. Um, we don't. That's not what we do, and but I think it's amazing. It's out there, and I hugely respect the band to do it. Um, but that's just not our thing. We our thing is to make stuff that sounds the most fierce and the dead there is. So whilst we wouldn't hope to compete with Guthrie going to this world, but we would be focused on being at the best at what we can do in our own style that's completely different to what they do. So um, whilst I hugely respect it, I think we're going down a different path to that. You know, I mean, it's a, it's, we're doing something yeah. so different. That's, I think that's why people like Guthrie and the, you know, Brian who, who got us that gig, like us, is because we're not doing anything similar to them. We're doing something that's so different. Like um, I'm doing, um, I did a gig with Mike Canini, and he, he was really supportive of what we were doing because it, it is so different. It's so, um, it's not down that path. You know what I mean? It's, it's just a, you know, and, and we've been so lucky to play with these wonderful musicians who I hugely respect. Um, and you know, we just do something different, really, and it's and it's kind of why it works, I suppose. That might be why people are really jumping on this new album as well, because it, it's sort of filling a, a space there that that I think really works. Um, you know, the, the, when you guys record, well, it, this album especially has a very sort of raw live sound. It, it, are you guys recording mostly live the backing tracks, or how do you guys put stuff together? Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, we 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 track. This one is probably our most sort of studio album, really, but because it was, um, we'd gone out and toured all these songs. So, the hot, virtually, probably 80, 90% of the songs we'd gone out and played it. We spent 2015, 2016, 2017 playing every sort of progressive rock festival there was. So, we played Rosfest, Summer's End, Rambling Man in front of, you know, it was like 10,000 people, Rosfest in front of, you know, the crowd at Rosfest are fantastic. Um, Summer's End we did um, um, we did basically HRH Prague we opened for Hawkwind we did lots of quite big gigs PFM and you know all these sort of bands that draw quite a big audience and you know getting the opportunity to, to play with Dave Lombardo's band and, and stuff like that and, and the right. Aristocrats and all these guys and because we went out and played all this material live for so long it, it sort of required sort of road legs basically so yeah. we had something we could play you know we had this material that was quite strong to play sort of in front of you know and, and we had that live feel too just because we gigged it so much I remember reading the thing about um, uh, when Porcupine Tree did um, um, uh uh, Fear of Blank Pregnant and those were the things they did before they, did, they toured the whole album live and I think that's something that's really useful for bands to do is to go out and play the material live you just learn it so much more you learn how to get a really good feel for it and so that's probably why it's got that sort of feel to it yeah no, that makes perfect sense you have two singles I guess that I've seen on YouTube I, you know not that single really matters you know nowadays but the the first two tracks from the album uh, Trucks and 1991 both sort of straight ahead driving rocker type songs yeah. um, you know when you look what do you look for in a song with, that you're writing that once it finally works you you as a band you guys say well this, we, this is good We've, we like how this one's going well, we we tend to have something that's 
we uh, lots of riffs and lots of bits, and then we'd spend most of the time removing all the bits until whatever's left is the sort of bits that we still really like and work best, and you know, kind of work as as a full band. Less, less is more so, type of thinking. Well, it's, yeah, it's sort of quality control. Really, one of the things that what happens is we'll tend to bring bits in. And then the other guys in the band will just say, oh, "I don't like that," or "Can we change that?" Or, and it'll, it's a very democratic writing process. So when it comes out the other end, it's completely different to whoever bought the original parts in. It becomes this sort of um, mutant thing that, that, that you know it, that none of us could have thought of as individuals, really. So um, it's, yeah, it just becomes its own thing. So you know that's that's kind of how it gets to the end of it. I meant to ask actually earlier when we started we got into talking but so you know how, how did you get started in all this I know that the band's been around not that long really right since 2010 from from what I gathered yeah. uh, but you were playing before that a long time and like you said you had lessons you know as a kid and so how did you get into all of this well it was yeah just playing I had lessons guitar, really good guitar teacher when I was a kid it was really into my vision and King Crimson and all that stuff. So that was kind of the standard that was set. So it was like, yeah. if you want to be good, you know, Stardust and you know, Fractures. That's the, you know, this is the level of playing that's required. Which, which, to be honest, in the early 1990s, it wasn't the level of playing that's required. But I was sort of drummed into me that that's what you needed to do. Um, then I played in bands for for a few years and stuff, and then eventually I um. Uh, Started doing solo guitar gigs just with a loop pedal, and I ended up sort of drifting into the prog and post rock scenes because there was nowhere else for me to go. Um, and I ended up playing with people for like uh, opening for all sorts of people like Frost and IQ, and you know, those sort of really great British kind of neo prog bands, really. That I, uh, music that I hadn't really grown up with, but I, I learned about, and that, you know, there's some fantastic musicians in that. And, and like, I became quite good friends with like Simon Godfrey and, and Jem, and you know all that lot. And you know, and 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 then it got to the point where I was sort of jamming on stuff with some friends, and that became the Fierce of the Dead. And, and then we ended up sort of doing lots of um, uh, gigs and and just building up. We sort of fell in with um, like Knife World. Um, who's a friend of ours and um, it was sort of similar sort of uh, unusual rock music bands and sort of, then sort of Trojan Horse and then it gradually sort of grew through word of mouth and um, we just got the big gigs got just bigger and bigger and then I remember we were doing one um, and we were playing this festival and it was like the headliners were like White Snake <laughs> and we were on the other stage and there was like 10,000 people there and I remember saying to my mate, it's like we were the first band on on the small stage. And I said to my mate, oh, I won't go anywhere watching that. So it'll be fine. But because no one else was playing at the same time, everybody was on our stage watching us. And it sort of, I think the word of mouth from that seemed to um, set up the sort of the follow me bit. And then we did sort of Art Tangent with um, Dillinger Escape Plan. So one, I remember we were playing, one week we were playing White Snake, next week we were playing with Dillinger Escape Plan. And then the next week we were playing with PFM and people, and it all just got became quite quite strange that we were sort of crossing over between sort of Hawkwind and then on one side and then sort of PFM and so and then Frost we supported and then um, we did um, Rambling Mound Festival, this huge festival and Rosfest and Summer's End and HRH Prog and um, That's cool. we just basically just well it just gradually grew and we we couldn't. Um, we didn't expect it because you know you're playing music that's so uncommercial, but the word of mouth built up and built up, and then when this album came out, you know, a few weeks ago, there seemed to be a reaction we just didn't expect. Um, but I suppose it's just because of all that word of mouth, all that gigging, and, and you know, we're really lucky to have a very loyal fan base who have really supported us, who are like just the, the the nicest people, and they're very. There's a very much a community around the band of people who are into it and, you know, sort of um, are very supportive of it. So um, it's, it's just been a gradual thing. And then it sort of tipped over in the last few weeks where it seems to become a lot more popular, which is which is bizarre, but very much appreciated. Um, <laughs> well, it, it, you know, the UK <laughs> especially, I mean, it's it's so supportive of prog music, it seems, and, and also in, in other... Other countries in Europe and and that sort of thing, much more so than in the U.S., where it, it, there's a better underground movement. Bands have a little bit more attention here in the states than than they used to, for sure. 
Um, but but being in the UK has got to be great for for gigging and and selling records and all that sort of thing. We're, we're very lucky to sort of come along at the right time. And there's also you know there's various you know there's bands um, like Haken who are great, and you know, there's a lot of bands doing interesting stuff. And it's not necessarily yeah. stuff that's similar to what we do, but the kind of there's a move movement around those sort of bands and you can see that there's a lot going on you know it's quite varied within the sort of the progressive thing there's, there's you know there's there's us at one end Haken Knife World um, Pineapple Thief Stephen Wilson and you know there's lots of different stuff going on right that's not uh, exactly the same but it's been adopted by um, you know listeners of your podcast the people who who read Prog Magazine you know all these sort of various sort of people and that it is quite diverse, really. That you know, you'd have, and there's like Mogwai as well, and you know, all this sort of stuff. Whereas, is there's not necessarily a massive crossover cyclically, but it is in certainly in terms of attitude, and people are just trying to make interesting rock music. Which is well, it's also you know, funny to me too that like how everything gets pushed into the, the prog bubble now, and Prog Magazine writes about ELO being a prog band and i love ELO, but i never thought of them as a prog band but hey why not let's let's throw them in there well i mean i don't know i mean i love ELO. um yeah I, I, it, it, when um, i've got the ELO box set um but because I, I love pop tunes and i think ELO are a fantastic pop band i think abba are a fantastic pop band i think you know the beatles are a fantastic pop band but i, I don't really you know the definitions are are quite broad but um you know, there's stuff, um, on, on, especially on the first two ELO albums, very prog. In the beginning, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I will give them that. But Definitely. certainly not the uh, um, not the famous stuff, I don't think. But, yeah. but not, uh, not like, it's good, whatever, you know. <laughs> I think yeah, it's I'm great. Not, I'm not complaining no, at absolutely. all that, you know, um, um, we're getting to the point where um, we've got, um, you know, such a diverse scene and, and also, you know, in the seventies, I'm sure people did go and see King Crimson, Will Make, and go and see ELO the next week because that's what people are into. You know, I remember going to see through my uh, friend's dad's record collection, and he had loads of interesting stuff in there, like Crimson and and but he had all the ELO stuff, and we loved ELO like we loved King Crimson. There was no divide for us, you know. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that you know labeling things it just doesn't matter, does it? You know, it's just all about um, about listening to interesting music and creating interesting music and being part of a community that listens to interesting music. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, it's common now for a lot of musicians uh, to be in three or four bands at a time. That seems to be one of the big trends that, that goes on with a lot of places. Is that something that you've ever tried to do or you try to avoid? Uh, I just haven't got time, really, because... Um, uh, I've got a family, and we, we you know, and and the fierce and the dead just takes up so much time because it's it's it sort of became out of control. In that, um, uh, I work with adults with autism as well, which is a great thing to do. I really love doing that, and um, the fierce the dead's become my other time is is pretty much taken up with it because it's just become slightly out of control. Really, we never expected it to do. So, I mean. I've played a lot of, um, my friend Andy Tillerson is uh, from the Tangent, I think you've had him on before, sure. haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, me and Andy do something together where we just do it like a improvised thing, so we do that two or three, uh, we'll do it once or twice a year, um, and that's me and Andy, we, we meet up and we play a show in front of either a small invited audience or a festival, and we'll do like an hour of improvised music, sort of space music, or sometimes we play rock and roll sometimes we play metal sometimes it could be anything we play and it's it, the course of a set will go from playing um something that sounds like um craft work and then and something that sounds like um steely dan and then it's it's all over the place but it's a lot of fun um and so i do that with andy tillerson i do um i play on you know, cosmograph played on some cosmograph records and stuff but i mean yeah, you know, there's a lot of people like John Mitchell, for example, he does like two or three different things and stuff. You know, there's there's people who, who have the time to do that, and but really at the moment, it's, it's still, because the Fierce of Dead's become quite a, a time consuming thing because of the you know we do so much of it on hands ourselves, and uh, we signed to Bad Elephant Music, who are a 
a great label and they've done a lot to support us but um, we need to make sure we're putting the time in ourselves as well um, so it's just you know we, we're very interactive with the fan, the fan community and it's just we just don't have time to to, to play multiple bands really I mean I, I, there's lots if I had more time I would love to do it but it's just <laughs> right. it's really cool. not reality um, really down, so. so last couple of quick questions uh, uh, what's the first prog album you bought and what's the most recent one you bought okay so the f- uh, depends right okay so probably the first program I bought was Red by King Crimson uh, myself, but my guitar teacher had been lending me all the Maravishni albums, all the Bruford albums, all that stuff. But the first one I went out and bought was probably Red because uh, I think Kurt Cobain talked about it in an interview um, or someone like that. So it was, it was quite a. You know, oh, I, remember, I wouldn't I, have I, known I, him to be <laughs> recommend King Crimson, but that's interesting. And, and Red totally blew my mind, and yeah. you know, it's so heavy and so powerful and. You know, it's 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 a um, it's a very important record for me, to be honest. In terms of the music, but, you know, Starless makes me cry. It will yeah. always make me cry when the melody comes back in at the end. Um, and you know, it's, it was such a big record for me. So yeah, and Red, and then most recently, I suppose uh, the last record that I bought in the last few months, well, last probably uh, is that I really liked is the Orange Clocks album. Who are friends of mine um, who make very strange psychedelic prog space music, and they said they write this a story about an alien uh, who goes on a journey. It's quite out there. Um, oh, no, that I've never heard. Fun, and it's just really this um, quite sort of gong Osric ten, Osric Tentacle sort of thing, um, but also quite sort of modern production as well it's a guy um, called Russ Russell who produces Napalm Death Records and all that produced it so yeah I'm a big fan of that one Orange Clocks oh cool we'll check that out uh, well if anybody listening to this if you haven't picked up the new Fierce and the Dead album it is out now uh, it's called Euphoric it actually came out May 18th um, where can what's the website again is it just fierceandthedead.com uh, yeah lovely thank you and uh, all right, man, we will uh, be in touch uh, again uh, soon. Hopefully we'll get to see you someday soon here in the States again. I don't know if you guys have any plans. We're, we're looking at coming back next year. So we just, we, we've been offered a couple of festivals. So um, it just depends how it works out. But after sort of doing Ross Fest, we, we're so keen to come back. We love playing in the States. So. But yeah, th- thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I'm, I'm a listener. so uh, Awesome, man. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Ben. I'm sorry it took so long to have you on. <laughs> Not at all. It's, it's, it's been really cool being on. Thank you so much. All right, man. Take it easy. All the best. Take care. Lovely talking to you. Thanks so much. Bye. Right. Thanks to Matt for the interview. We're going to close with the opening track off of the Euphoric. This is Truck. For upcoming news and interviews, please check theparkreport.com, follow us on Facebook, at The Park Report on Twitter, download the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and on YouTube. Thank you. (laughs) 